right. So now I'm going to do a review on other d dust and probably at some point do a little walkthrough on character generation. So this is what we're working for. I do have it on PD PDF, but we've got the book. And again, this is just going to be a, uh, a review. I won't go too deep into it, but first thing, you know, let's look at the art. The art on the outside is good. Now, art is not something that necessarily is super important to me. Um, I can name a lot of games that have very simple art that are still really amazing. So on the inside, you have this kind of, you know, black, white, ink art. Uh, a lot of it's very good. Like this whole Road Warrior thing, Mad Max thing. They're being chased by some bikes. So general layout is pretty basic. You know, it's white paper with black ink on it. The, the, uh, it's easy to read, easy to figure out. It is just crawling with tons of really cool charts. That's a cool picture right there too. It? Some kind of mutant beast trying to come through a bulkhead. So let's get to it then. Um, the premise is this, this can and does exist. If you use the standard setting for stars without number, this is earth after the screen destroyed all the warp gates or teleportation gates or whatever, the stargates. Um, interesting. I wouldn't change the setting, really. There's no reason to. Uh, we've already uh, established it's a OSR game, and that means uh, rule systems are very similar to what you would find in basic D&D. BX, specifically, is what I'm talking about. And you're going to have your same attributes, your strength, intelligence, and whatnot, except that starting scores go no longer than three, no lower than three and no higher than 18. And your max attributes are plus two or minus two. So you'll see in, um, in later settings, Your attributes, actually, I think even in BX, an 18 was a plus three. Uh, but And then in later settings, it goes all the way up to plus fours and, and all that. Uh, this, no, not so much. The character generation, I will make a video going through that, seems to be pretty easy. It's, it's kind of a, it's strange because it uses classes and backgrounds but the classes and backgrounds are really only uh, skill packages. And the classes give you some special abilities. Like one of them I really like, the survivor. The special ability of that class is if you're reduced to zero instead of dying, you actually get back up, but with one hit point left per level of scavenger you have. Uh, so that's pretty good. I mean, they got pretty much they got to kill you twice. Unless it does make a side note, unless it's something no human could avoid. So I guess if somebody beheads you, you're not getting back up. The uh, mechanics, okay, mechanics is, is uh, kind of interesting. It, it's kind of a task system. I always say kind of. I apologize. It's not kind of. It's a task system. So you roll a die 20. You add any bonuses, penalties, modifiers that apply, beat a number to succeed. And oh, I like this as a slayer. You can be a paladin, a noble warrior, a gunslinger. Wow. I chose to be the man with no name as a uh, when I was looking through for my survivor. Slayer. Once per fight, you may use this skill before rolling attack. You will hit your target on anything but a natural one. I think I like the getting back up after being killed ability better, but still. Uh, regardless, armor classes in this game lower the better, but how that works out mathematically or in practice is when you make an attack roll, you roll a die 20, you add any positive uh, modifiers to that, 
and then you add your opponent's armor class. If you get a 20 or above, you hit. So let's say you're attacking somebody wearing just normal clothing. Uh, yeah, old Terran clothing, encumbrance zero, armor class seven, right? When you roll your die 20, right off the bat, you're adding a seven to that. So I rolled a 15 uh, plus seven, that's a 22. So before I even roll modifiers, I know I've hit that person. Uh, scrap metal armor has an armor class of five. This is your starting stuff. I assume there's much better stuff in the game. And then weapons work just like every other role-playing game you, you will encounter, excepting the one I wrote, meaning that uh, once you've determined whether you hit, you roll whatever die of damage it is. In this case, a sword does die eight damage. Your average character has one to six hit points at first level. And a pistol does die eight. A breech-loading rifle does one die 10 plus two Gs. So if you get hit with one of those jokers, there's a really good chance that's going to be it for you. Uh, there is a section on mutations. This section is pretty big. You get to choose, uh, you get to spend character points. Okay, once you make a character, you get three points. You can use those points either to roll mutations. Each point gives you a roll. Or you can just add uh, a bonus to an attribute up to a max of plus two in that attribute. No attribute can be more than that. So you have uh, different kinds of mutations, uh, different benefits, stigmas, and flaws. Tons of charts. I mean, chart after chart after chart. Literally no two mutants should mathematically be exactly the same. Uh, you can have additional animal parts or animal parts. Body parts, you can, um, oh, this is how to generate, wow, is this, okay, mutant benefits, uh, nanate neural interface, grants you a mental power, a sensory power, your enormous vitality grants you endurance power, okay, so you roll for mutation benefits, and then you roll on the actual chart. So what is a mental power? Doubtful or double mind, dreadful air, empath, hand of will, mind speech, or psychic lash. I don't know what those do exactly, but let's look up one. Double mind. You have parallel thought processes and can simultaneously perform two actions, provided at least one of them is purely mental in nature. As a side result, you cannot be surprised. Okay, that's pretty cool. And then this set of charts right here allows you to create a creature. So you roll one die eight. And uh, I'll just go through this really quick. Again, I'm trying not to make an hour long video. I know my videos run long. I'm, I'm thinking 30 minutes is about right, especially with my meandering way of speaking. So if I roll a four, we get a canine. All right, so we've got a canine and then we roll right here. And uh, environment, we've got canine, and it lives seven in subterranean areas. Its exotic power is it's a shapeshifter. All right. So you can build all these monsters, it looks like. Oh, this is also if you have an extra body part, you can roll. Hmm. Again, if I made a character, I would avoid the mutation. I, even in Gamma World, I like playing pure strain humans the best. So, um, as I said before, the, the system boils down to this. Saving throws, attack rolls, and skill checks. Uh, your skill checks are, are, a skill check is two dice six, right? So, to perform a skill check, and I'm just looking at a book, you roll two dice six, uh, add them together, add the player's skill and any modifiers. And if the total exceeds the difficulty number set by the GM, it's a success. So this is almost like classic traveler. You know, your two dice six plus whatever beat a number succeed. 
Uh, why he went with the 2 die 6 instead of just doing a 20, I don't know. I mean, mathematically, it will work out the same, 1 die 20. And I actually had originally assumed that's what he would have done. But, you know, on the other hand, I like using different kinds of dice, too. Hit rolls are, as I said, you roll 1 die 20, add your skill with whatever weapon you're using, then um, add your attribute. So... If you choose to use ranged weapons, you get to add your dex. So it's one die 20 plus whatever your dex is, plus armor class. And if it's a higher than a 20, then a hit is caused. Saving throws work just like old school D&D. You roll die 20 and you hope you get higher than whatever your saved number is. Saved numbers are determined by your, your class. So, all right, here's your skill difficulties. Uh, an average skill is a difficulty of six. Uh, challenging skills are an eight. And it just goes up, it looks, by, by increments of two. So six, eight, then nine, 11, 13, and 15. Uh, things that you should expect your character to be able to do without a problem, you don't require a check. So if a guy has skill in uh, navigation, say, um, which is your ability to... to know where you're going between point A and B through the wilderness, unless there's like some kind of uh, extenuating circumstances, you don't have to make them roll for that. They, they would just be able to, you know, navigate their way. Uh, extenuating circumstances that might actually require a roll could be it's storming or something like that, or trying to do it at night. Saving throws, uh, you have physical, mental effects, then evasion, tech, and luck. Uh, any, and I'll just read one. When a character's well-being depends purely on dumb luck rather than any effort they might make, a luck saving throw is in order. And to quote a uh, really brave and heroic person from the 13th Warrior, luck will carry a man as often as skill. I paraphrase. I think he actually... The quote is, oftentimes luck will carry him in. Anyway, combats, roll initiative, which in this game is a die eight. Then go in a sin, or yeah, descending order. So whoever rolls the highest, it's a die eight plus dex. And whoever rolls the highest, you just go down to the bottom and then go over again. I don't know if you would re-roll initiative. It doesn't say. It just says uh, go from highest to lowest. PCs win all ties. Uh the closest to the GM's right acts first. Okay, if two PCs tie, whoever's closest to the right. Usually what I do is in the case of a tie, whoever has the higher decks. And then if they're both the same decks and everything like that, then whoever has the lighter weapon. But that might that's a lot more complicated than this, whereas whoever's sitting closest to the right. Um, when everyone has their turn to act, it loops back around from the top. Okay. Uh, a lot of times in my game, when I do use individual initiative, which isn't often, and old school essentials, say, or DCC, I use group initiative more. Um, but when I do use uh, individual initiatives, I tend to re-roll at the end of each combat. Adds time to it, but it mixes it up. There's advantages and disadvantages to both, and some players prefer one to the other. Um, in my DCC game, I wasn't even rolling a, uh, oh, wait a minute, in, not DCC, in Modifius Conan, Conan players automatically go first uh, all the time in initiatives, but a the GM can spend a doom to make an NPC go before a player. So normally the players just do whatever they want, but when the, D, the GM really wants to screw with them, you know, then they can do that. Back to the review. I know I got off. All right, so there's rules for overland travel, including traveling over ancient roads, plains, so you got different terrain. Rules for your riding beast, uh, injuries, uh, natural healing, diseases and toxins. Let's look at a disease. Okay, pneumonia. Toxicity, eight. Interval, five days. Virulence, two. At each interview interval, the victim becomes weaker, more feverish, and less capable of breathing. 
With each failed saving throw, they gain first the coughing, then the fever, then the wheezing negative conditions. On a fourth failed saving throw, they die. All right. So, uh, then again, you know, before modern times and Z-Packs and all that, uh, antibiotics, pneumonia did kill a lot of people. Still does, but... All right, now we've got a section on after the injuries and diseases. You uh, you suffer from the hunger or thirsty conditions. You can't naturally heal. A well-nursed character who has at least eight hours of rest or gains their level and hit points every morning when they wake. Well, that's kind of cool. You spend the day doing nothing but resting. They regain additional hit points equal to their level, plus two more for every level of tech medical possessed by their physician. All right. So then we go to the equipment chart, page 45. It explains the tech levels, which are zero, Neolithic Stone Age, one, Medieval or Renaissance, two, Steam Engine Gunpowder, three, Late 20th Century, four, Civilian Grade Old Terran, Technology, so sci-fi, and five, restricted or mil-spec old Terran. All of your equipment has equipment conditions. Perfect worn, light damage moderate, heavy broken, and ruined. So when you find equipment, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I will say this. If you find, say, some kind of weapon in, in the ruins or something like that, right, uh, you roll for the condition of the weapon. So even though you find, say, I'm going to make something up based on nothing I know uh, about the game, but let's, okay, you find some kind of military-grade laser rifle, right? Uh, you could find it, but it could be broken. The good news is certain characters, like the scrounger or scavenger or whatever, they have skills allowing them, if they have access to parts, to repair things. So there you go. You can salvage goods. You can break down stuff to uh, sal sal you can break down ruined items to get spare parts to repair other items. Uh, character advancement is what you would expect. Every time you go up a level, you gain three skill points that you can use to raise your skills. And this costs an amount of points determined by whatever skill level you have and what you're going to. The speaker and the scrounger actually gain four skill points. You do not have to spend these skill points. You can save them. And uh, uh, you also gain hit points. But instead of rolling a die six and adding it, because hit points are always die six in this game, no matter what, instead of rolling a die six and just adding it to your character, you roll a number of dice equal to the level you're going up to. And that becomes your new hit point and your old hit points are just erased. Uh, I think the only rule on that is um, it can never be lower than your, your previous hit points. It always goes up by one. And then, of course, you add your constitution bonus if you have any. So the example here is a fourth level slayer with a plus one constitution who has just attained fifth level will roll five die six plus five to determine their new hit points. Okay, because in addition to rolling the dice, you add your 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 existing hit die. Okay, so that's cool. And then uh, we've already talked about skill checks. Oh, that's a quick reference sheet. Now, history of the world, it doesn't really get into exactly what happened. There's an era called the Year of Smoke, the late 21st century or whatever, where apparently somebody nuked the hell out of someone else, uh, a Russo-European war or something. No one is 100% sure who started what. It's been a long time ago, and at this point, a lot of that information is just lost. But it does mention Russo-European war, a United States-Chinese war, nuclear exchanges between Pakistan and India, or, or perhaps, you know, whatever. Then the spike drive in the first wave, which anyone familiar with Stars Without Number will know that pretty much the spike drive is a jump drive, like in Traveler. It allows you to transnavigate point A to B without crossing between the two. So you're literally jumping or maybe folding, make up whatever you want. Um, and after the spike drive, 
humans become more and more common uh, possessing, uh, how do you say, uh, psychic abilities. And these psychics were then later trained to be able to open stargates. I'm going to call them stargates. I'm not sure what they actually call them in this book or in the air book because I wrote my, my a different system. But when the stargates came into existence, spike drives went out of existence. And pretty much people that the Terran uh, mandate didn't like, they just sent out into the frontier and they're like, ah, get out of here, you know. And they kind of forgot how to even build spike drives because it was such old technology. Yeah, it'd be the equivalent of asking a guy right now with no training whatsoever to figure out how to build, I don't know, a, an astrolabe or something like that, you know, from ancient times. Um, and of course, there was the whole, the scream again, if you're familiar with Stars Without Number, something happened, a energy wave washed over human space and presumably everywhere, uh, long and short is it burned out 99% of the psychic's brains, just killed them dead. And the ones that didn't kill it drove completely insane. And they just start running around causing problems and murdering people and just burning stuff up and, and whatever. So after the scream happened, technology in the, the Terran mandate just collapsed. Whole worlds died and whatever. Earth being one of them. And uh, that's kind of where you're set. Now we get to the meat of the book. That's just your background. Your little creating your wastelander. You figure out where you're from. Uh, one thing is, you could set this game literally anywhere. So if you live, say uh, you're one of my watcher, uh, one of the viewers, and you live in Canada, Germany, Mexico, anywhere in the world, uh, you set this game there, right? I mean, one thing about most games, and the American side of me is like, America, right? Uh, but most most games are just set in America, like futuristic games. They're very USA-specific uh, in a lot of ways. Even like old Gamma World, the settings were all like in Pittsburgh or wherever, right? This game doesn't really go into all that. You can set it wherever you want. And uh, and now, again, starting at page 65, you see the real meat on the bones of this game. A little quick scan there. And what that is, as is true of Stars Without Number, is Kevin Crawford gives you just amazing charts to figure out anything you want to figure out because these games are really made to be played sandbox. Uh, being where the DM comes up with the bare bones of what's going on. And then you, the, the GM, as they call it in this game, the dungeon master and the players kind of find out what's going on together. So it's almost like in a strange way, you can almost call it. Um, all right. I forget the word. English is not my first language. I'm not going to get hung on it. Oh, um, it's almost like the, the DM and the players are on the same side. You're both playing the game together because the DM doesn't know everything any more than the players do. He only kind of knows. Uh, so let's say the players are traveling through the waste and you rolling on your chart or whatever, and you're like, okay, they're going to encounter an enclave, a civilized enclave or ruins or whatever. Well, what this game tells you is, here's a chart. Let's see what this enclave is about. I rolled a five. The enclave is a small community with one die four plus 100 adult inhabitants, okay? Enclave government, let's roll her up. Uh, it's monarchy, and so it's monarchy, led by a ruling family. The core of the enclave, let's see, I got 12 here. A port or warehouse full of supplies. Um, enclave tech, that one's going to be a percentile roll, so no problem though. I have my handy Walmart brand dice in front of me. Uh, tech level one, so the enclave, enclave is tech one, so that puts it, you know, medieval to renaissance period. So you'll, you'll not be buying too, too many lasers there probably, 
but they might have an armory cranking out some chain mail or something. Then you've got enclave tags. These work the same as in Stars Without Number. They're just kind of, uh, they help with adventure hooks is really what they are. So we've got a one, two. So you roll a die six, have it. So I rolled a two, which is one. And then you roll a die 10. And the first tag on this enclave is Ancient Hate. And just looking at the chart over here, Ancient Hate, you, uh, they, the locals accuse PCs of being allies of this foe that they hate. DM will have to make it up. Maybe the chief wants to use the allies against the enemy. That's an option. Locals suspect the PCs of being spies. Locals want proof of the PC's shared hatred. So maybe they're like, hey, you can't come in here unless you bring us the scalp of one of these things we hate. It doesn't say exactly what they hate. They just hate something else. Uh, you might have, well, friends within the group. Locals with secret ties to the enemy might want to recruit you. Then things. Proof that the original atrocity wasn't the enemy's fault. Could, could That's an adventure hook. Complication. The two groups are once united. Uh, and places, an ancient massacre site, dangerous no man's land. And there are just pages of these. And again, you could use them for D&D. There is no reason you couldn't use these in your D&D campaign. Just uh, like right here, nobility, enemies, a paranoid lord, sneering princeling, a toady seeking favor with his masters or a brutal conqueror. So those are options, right? Friends, the downtrodden peasants. A heroic lordling standing up to the tyrant, maybe. A noble in need of outside aid or a pretender to the throne. These could be your friends. Things, uh, some sort of artifact or regalia of authority. Uh, tribute extracted from the commoners. So maybe you're going to try and steal the taxes, Robin Hood. Uh, maybe there's a relic, uh, a charter of authority, complications. The current nobles are usurpers. Uh, the reality of a noble caste is apparent only to the locals. Aristocratic nobles are really are enlightened compared to the peasant leaders. So maybe, you know, here's the complication. You, your initial uh, thing is we need to help these peasants overthrow the nobles. And then you find out the peasants are worse, <laughs> you know, uh, and places. It could be a splendid audience hall, uh, fields worked by peasant labor, large fortifications, Actual shops with production for sale. Uh, again, like I said, this could be used in any role-playing game of any genre. So tons of pages. It just goes on and on. It's like this guy just writes great charts. And, they, and each and every one of them gets the old noodle burning, okay? Next, uh, ruins. We're playing a post-apocalyptic game. Ruins are incredibly important, right? So we, again, we'll go through it real quick. This is a die 12 chart, Ruin Origins. Rolling that die 12, I get a five. These ruins were formerly a mandate pleasure resort. Um, and these resorts catered to every possible desire. Then we get a die 10 on the next chart, a four. What destroyed it? Disaster, a vicious plague sent the original inhabitants fleeing. Most of these sicknesses were nano-modified bio-warfare agents released by the crazed. That's the uh, psychers that went nuts and said, try and kill everyone. And they may linger. All right. Ooh, nice. Who lives in these ruins? What I roll? Six. Mutants. Most such mutants are hereditary high shine sufferers. The high, okay, um, often with dangerous mental deformities. Ruin-dwelling mutants are often so maddened or vicious that no enclave will take them in. So, yeah, these are not good guys. And then again, you have your tags that go with the ruin. So you just, all right, so that's a tag of three. So a three, two on the chart is a forbidden fruit. And then pages and pages of, and you roll more than one tag for each place. Uh, I don't know if I said that. If I didn't, I apologize. But let's see what Forbidden Fruit says. Enemies, 
whispering things in the darkness. Demented devotees to a forbidden power. Remember how I was saying that Kasper Urbanski's Cults of Chaos was usable in every setting? Well, it's usable in this. I'll tell you that. It could be, anyway. I could see that. So you've got demented devotees of a foreign power. Then you break out Kasper Urbanski's book, roll on some charts, and now you know what, what it is they're devoted to and how they go about this devotion. Local convinced the PCs are tainted in some way or a thing that wants to escape the ruin, right? Friends within this ruin escaped former users of what the power, victims of the power, perjurer of the unclean. So you might have a paladin type that's in these ruins trying to destroy all the mutants or something. Investigator who must have the truth. Things, things are, uh, again, MacGuffins and treasures, you know, uh, so nano-based tech with hideous side effects, booster drugs, but with grim consequences, wholly useful and harmless stems made out of infants. That's actually literally what it says. Mind-enslaving maltech neural collars um, and complications. The locals need the ruins favors desperately. So maybe the mutants are addicted to something or other. Who knows? I mean... Bile mastermind appears harmless at first. The favors were harmless at first, but have been corrupted. Rivals fight to excess this ruin's power. And then places which, you know, where these encounters could happen. A darkened room full of whispering voices. A chamber walled in mutated flesh. An excessively perfect garden. Rooms carpeted in the bones of rival, rivals of the ruin's gifts. And again, these go on. So you've got your example of, uh, they, he gives examples. And then we talk about adventure creation, right? And this comes with a bunch of charts. So your first template is a die 12 chart. An enemy has goaded a complication into a crisis as a weapon to take out a friend regardless of collateral damage. And then the next one, uh, a one, a plague is racking a group and medical supplies are exhausted. An enemy seeks glory by bringing them back first. So these are just types of templates that you can roll on. Savagery, you know. There's, so you determine what kind of adventure you're trying to tell. Collapse, approbation, savagery, scavenging. Um, hey, thanks a lot. Um, so if you're, you're trying to deal with savagery, I wrote a one. An ethnic or cultural group is convinced of their destined rule over their neighbors and is striking out with bloody-handed zeal. So maybe a group of mutants have decided they're going to wipe out all non-mutants or otherwise backwards. I mean, whatever, you know, scavenging template. See, I love these. I could mess with these all night. Uh, nine, ancient notes suggest the prized thing was hidden in a place in the ruins, has an enemy in the ruins already found it. So you see right there, um, this is your scavenging. Something you're looking for or interested in is found in a place and has an enemy of yours already found it, you don't know. So that is the brilliance of this guy's game. Stars Without Numbers, which is free for download on Drive Through RPG. This game, I don't know any other games he, he does because this is all I've, I've played with, but uh, he gives you so many charts and so much information that even if you're running the game, it's almost like you're playing because you're rolling dice. You don't know what's going on. And then maybe when you get these bones, you know, these pieces of information, then you fill them in real quick for you and the party, and then you experience how they deal with it, and you just adjudicate the, the rules and let it ride, you know. Uh, we've got our big uh, list of encounters and plunder. So what kind of plunder do we got? Impoverished rebels. So a gunman. So it says what there might might be random loot. Weapons, you know, your typical weapons going all the way up to a semi-auto pistol, a shotgun, monoblade, submachine gun, combat rifles, combat shotguns, mag pistols, uh, 
I haven't went over this chart yet or the, the list yet, so I don't know what that is. Armor. And it starts out with like a shield and goes all the way up to storm plate and powered armor. So, you know, energy weapons, laser rifles, laser pistols, thermal pistols. Well, it says thermal, so some kind of heat gun. Maybe like a melted gun in Warhammer 40k. Plasma guns, sheer rifles, and neutron blasters. Remember, this game takes place in like 2837, so a bit in the future. And then common items, crowbars, thermal flares, water filters, uncommon items, Geiger counters, solar generators, um, spare parts for tech level three, tech level four, toxin detectors, vac suits, rare items, blueprints, uh, a nanofusion generator, power cells, bot override tag. All right, so that's kind of cool. Quirks, uh, every item might have a quirk, like it might, you know, if you're on 99 or 100, the item is uh, indestructible. That's good. Items are war, Ignat enigmatic item traits. Like when you hand somebody an item, it could be uh, an arm long tube or a glove or whatever. So side effects from using an item. Activation methods, data outputs, so random belongings. Uh, say you find a skeleton buried in the ruins, rotten, but his clothes are still on him. You roll to see what random items he might have on him, he or she. So I rolled a 63. Uh, you go through the, the skeleton and you find a statue in once precious metals. So... Bear in mind, gold and stuff like that are no longer precious in this game. Food is much more important than the ammo. Um, so maybe it's a small statue of the Virgin Mary or uh, something like that. A good luck charm. So he's got rules for actually uh, building enclaves. Like the player characters can actually put together enclaves and, and try and take care of them. There's creeds, you know that the enclaves can follow, like creed details. Let's roll a die 12, let's see. So one, one, three, okay. Okay, root ideology of the enclave is Christianity. Uh, what's popular amongst the enclave is uh, local elite rulers and positive negative traits. Uh, brutal initiation rites. So these could be a, this could be a Christian sect where they revere their leaders, whether they're priests or whatever. And part of being a member of it is you have to maybe, you know, scourge yourself and, you know, be cleansed of your sins. Uh, there's charts for family details, Again, there's charts for so many things, and all of the charts are, are very useful. Uh, polities, let's see. Uh, so in this particular thing, uh, symbols of belonging to the group are hairstyles or body paint. Maybe these guys shave their heads and they tattoo a big cross across their head, you know, like the priest. Architectural style of the place, I rolled a seven. Uh, so the buildings are made out of adobe and mud brick for the most part. And what are their habits towards outsiders? I rolled an eight. They're rapacious swindlers of the unwary. So maybe they feel like if you're not a member of their particular sect, they're allowed to abuse you. And that's for your politics. They've got rules for raiders, uh, rules for barding and trading, primitive weapons all the way up to stuff that a photon axe, you know. I don't even know what that is, but... It's there. It's just tons of equipment, lifestyle stem effects. Common stems served as vectors for a host of lifestyle oriented products. Let's see, like it says here, if you take it and you roll a one on a die 10, all your body hair falls off and won't grow until a purge stem is taken. Awkward. Uh, we've got our, our list of vehicles that go from sailboats all the way up to ground cars, hover cars, 
crawlers, battle wagons, utility tractors, and GFBs, which is, uh, you know, gravity fighting vehicle or gravity fighting vehicles. Dogs, still man's best friend, ponies. Again, going through the review. I don't know if it's a review and I'm just telling you how awesome this game is. There's a really cool bestiary uh, involving beast men, uh, which could be like ant people, bull people, fish people, all the different, you know, animal people. Blinder birds is kind of a bird that specifically goes for your eyes. Uh, cultists of the crazed, flay snakes, a glow turtle. Jeez, it's a gigantic turtle that looks like it wants to just take a chunk out of somebody's ass. Grinder worms, gut weasels. And then, of course, your typical humans. Man scorpions. Uh, three meters tall, four-legged abdomen tapering into a vicious sting. Yeah. See, the way they, and they have psychics. Uh, yeah, psychics maybe. Or, no, that's a different thing. Uh, the way they explain mutations is, Pretty much, it's it's not just radiation, but when the scream hit, the crazed, the mutants that want to destroy everything because they were complete maniacs, they unleashed nanobots onto the surface of the planet. And these nanobots were designed to actually heal and correct genetic issues, but the crazed modified them to do the opposite. So the nanobots... Also, some kind of times, uh, you know, talked about, you know, the high glow and all that. When they infiltrate the human body, they start, re well, not just a human, a creature's body. They just start rewriting it. And you end up with man scorpions and gut weasels. So, in addition to all of that, uh, the uh, robots that were in use before by the mandate before the fall. Some of them are still functioning and many of them are just, their, their uh, software is no longer what it should be and they're just doing whatever. Now they do give you a map here and like original uh, Gamma World, it looks like the center of the map is the Monastery of St. Lee which is southeast of Irontown, so that's Pittsburgh probably, and uh, north of DC, uh, which is the furthest area down, and then north of DC is Delphia, so Philadelphia. There's Old York, Big Grange, I don't know what that could be, it's north of, uh, you know, Sanctuary, Ascension, Boston, so yeah. The latter, they, if these nanobots get in, they can just do whatever. And in this game, you can, uh, you like I was saying, I don't know if you are here earlier, you can actually make mutant characters. So there's a little bit of a, a little bit of a gazetteer here it explains uh, like what Renaissance is, Iron Town, 300 adults, a monarchy ruled by the family of the foreman. So there is a little bit of a pre, pre-made setting, but there's no need to actually follow it. And then, of course, pages upon pages of random encounters. So, like, here's the chart for Deathlands and Acropolis encounters, which sounds really neat. Let's see, I rolled a seven. So uh, if you're in these areas, a building collapses or Deathland sinkholes have made progress treacherous. One day, six days are spent in the same area trying to get clear of the wreckage. Minus one day for each level of navigation skill possessed by the group. So this is how you track overland travel. Quick NPC generation, I always love these. And again, useful for most anything. So let's see, one day 10, F ancestral ethnicity, it says here roll die twice, all right. So six Arabic and seven uh, lunar. So his ancestors were Arabic and 
people who lived on the moon. Uh, so now we roll to see what their build is. They are average build, life stage. He is married and elderly. I said he, but you know. Uh, memorable traits, nearsighted or hard of hearing. So, you know, we've got a hard of hearing, a mixed Arabic guy who's uh, average build and uh, elderly with a wife. And what is his big problems? It says here he's got some big problems we need to figure out. Eight. He follows a faith that is unpopular with the locals. So... Hopefully that don't mean he's living in a Catholic enclave and for whatever reason he's a Satanist. But, you know. All right. His current greatest desire is to get enough food to ensure his family's safety for a while. Well, yeah, that's a, that's a good desire. And then you can roll for favored clothing style, interesting NPC roles, and it gives you a bunch of charts for quick NPC stats. So let's say you just need a scrounger. You just turn to this page and there's, you know, six of them already made. Just stats, so you can just grab one. Quick name lists, and they're in a lot of different languages. So, so look, look here, let's go with uh, Swahili. If you don't know what to name your character, but you are Swahili, roll that die 20, and it looks like my character's name is Kafimbo, and his last name will be Matabita. A Fimbo Matabita. It's kind of cool. Got Zulu names too. So nice. Uh, the names they give are Arabic, Chinese, Indian, Lunar, Neo Egyptian, Swahili, and Zulu. Uh, and looking at the lunar names, they are the actually they're actually the lunar names are Russian. I mean, Alan, Alexander, Anatoly. Yorji, uh, Ivan, well, Jack, James, John, Michael, Neil, Owen, but Sergey, Vasily, Vladimir, uh, Egev, Evgeny, Yuri, and then for females, you know, Catherine, Christina, Aline, Kapana, uh, Catherine, Linda, Lou, actually that's Chinese, Lou and May, and then Pamela, Samantha, Tamara, Valentina, and Ivan, last names, Aldrin Armstrong, Chaffee Collins, Debravowski, Duke Furukawa, Gagarin, Garrett, Glenn Grissom, Heiss, Yunlong, Laville, McCaw. So, yeah, I guess you could just use that to represent people of no specific. Uh, I guess if I were making a, an American character or maybe Western European character, I would just use the lunar names. Or I know my brother would go straight for the Zulu names. He loves making characters of African descent. So we've got another table of features, another table of things you might find in a cavern, a chart of things you might find in a station or a bunker from, you know, before the devastation. Factory contents. Let's look at some of these real quick before we go through. These are on the percentile chart, so I wrote a 55. So you might find a computing room with long dead servers or a executive office with floor to ceiling windows. And what is this? Objects found in such site. That's features, so objects. A zero one strange device that duplicates printed matter. Hmm. So like a 3D printer thing? Or, or, Quick religion generator. We've already seen that, though. And it goes, uh, wow, holy cow. Not something you usually see in role-playing games made in America, but it has Catholic, uh, Theravada, if I butcher these names, forgive me, Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, Two Lands Faith, the Neo-Egyptian, Taoism, animism, ancestor worship, which I guess would be like uh, Shintoism. I think the Japanese kind of do that. Some of them, not all of them, obviously. Protestant or Orthodox Christianity. See, that's what you always see Protestant. 
But rarely in any role-playing game do you ever see mention of Orthodox Christianity. Come on, guys, we're the second largest Christian denomination, I'm pretty sure. You know, everything east of Poland is us, so cut us a break. Hinduism or a political ideology, which I would say would be like Marxism. Or maybe uh, not Jainism. Uh, North Korea, they're not really Marxists, but they're political is their religion, you know, and then you roll for attitude and principles of the, the faith. See, this is not good. Slavery is an expression of the faith's rule. Or slavery is an abomination before God. So, yeah, AIs are emissaries of God or AIs are the devil. So, yeah, and then you've got your quick encounter tables again. And the back you have your different character sheets. Each character sheet is specific to a class. So there's the ah, okay, there's the scrounger character sheet. If I can ever figure out how to do this, so you know, typical, typical stuff. And like I said, making these characters. I mean, you can make a character on on an index card, and I'll, I'll show that later. And then there's a chart, so you can keep track of enclaves and stuff like that. And then an index, which you would think would be a given, but so many games don't have a table context or, or content or, or an index. Why, I don't know. So anyway, I've rambled on, going on 50-something uh, minutes, heading into an hour. I'm going to end it. I actually would like to have ended this in 30 minutes. If I were to summarize the game, it's an OSR game set in a post-apocalyptic Earth, and it's grimdark. It is not, you know, funny and cutesy like some other post, like Gamma World can be. This game's a little bit more serious. That's that's the summation. What do I think of it? Well, I love it. I, you know, of course. Am I really okay? Let's let's full disclosure. I tend to love almost every game. I'm that guy. You know, I love games. Uh, there are a few games I don't like. There are no games I hate. So, but this is totally my style. I like games that are high action, sandbox, open world, deadly, you know, and uh, reward the player being smart and using the noodle rather than the character, just, uh, you know, things on a sheet and a roll. Uh, I'm not going to get into a rant, I promise, but that is an issue I have with modern gaming. When the character walks into the room, or the player, the DM says, short thing, you enter a room, and the player says, roll for perception. Well, what the hell is that? In old school d d it would be, you walk into a room, and the player would be like, well, I look around, what do I see? You know, And then the DM would be like, well, you know, there's a cabinet on one wall and a tapestry on the other and a big curtain. And directly across from you is a desk with a couple of ewers and a bowl and a mirror. At which point then the player would say, well, I'm going to investigate the desk. And specifically, I'm going to look at the drawers. You know, do I see any traps or anything? And that's when you would roll. This idea that you walk in and you're like, I made my perception check. Tell me everything about a room. You know, no. Uh, another thing I do not use in my games is the whole, uh, like, sense lie. Paladins in my game do not have detect alignment. None of that. Uh, so if a character, if if you're talking to an NPC and the NPC's like, I hear the hobgoblins in the next town are really friendly and they love people to come and come to dinner. And, you know, a player in 5e might be like, well, I'm going to roll and see if he's lying. And I would say, no. Do you think he's lying? It's up to the player, you know, figure it out. Uh, so yeah, modern gaming allows uh, skills and die rolls to be a crutch. And I don't believe that's good. But anyway, that's end rant. So this has been my long ass review of Other Dust by Kevin Crawford and published by Sign Nominee. It's a great game. And it, it goes directly with um, Stars Without Number. You could literally start a group in this game and then at some point have a starship arrive to Old Earth from wherever 
and the players jump on the starship and then shoot away from Earth into the rest of the galaxy to continue their adventures if you wanted to. Uh, conversely, you could have your stars without number characters land on Earth and have to figure something out for some reason. So, yeah, it, I think it's really worth it. And the PDF is not expensive, so um, I'm not getting paid anything for any of this. I do this just because I want to. Also, because I think infinite games and really good OSR titles do not receive the attention that they should. Uh, maybe one day there'll be a high-powered uh, group of incredibly charismatic people who will get together and they'll run a game of Stars Without Number, a campaign, or OSE or Other Dust or any of the other tons of great games out there. And yes, I'm, I'm comparing that to Critical Role, uh, but I doubt it. I'm going to end it there. So DM Jim or my church name, Constantine, uh, signing out. And this has been my long ass review on Other Dust. Corn dogs. <laughs>